He won the over, under, in the under further review. Hi, everyone. This is Will O'Toole, post-Super Bowl Park Ridge Sports History Program. Just a quick shout out to Howard Fredericks, who always does an unbelievable job producing this show and making it somewhat viable for everyone to watch <laughs> and get through. But anyway, I'd like to talk today a little bit about my, maybe my 10 favorite Super Bowls. Now, just a caveat, I'm doing this show prior to tonight, well, the Sunday, February 12th Super Bowl between the Kansas City Chiefs and, of course, the Philadelphia Eagles. As you saw in my cartoon, I did finally take or make a selection. I kind of think it would be cowardly not to at least give ex my expertise on the game. So I'm really just going with the Chiefs, 24-22. Only reason being, I think they probably have more experience and uh Nothing against the Eagles, terrific defense, terrific quarterback, but there's something about Mahomes that, uh, and actually I kind of go into this with today's show, there's something about Mahomes that is probably pretty special, and uh, that's why I think he'll probably win his second, but I'm sure I'll probably get more viewers watching this show to just discredit me and criticize my pick for the Chiefs if they lose today, but hey, it just makes for a, a more fantastic audience. Anyway, I'd like to do a little bit about my uh, probably 10 most significant Super Bowls. Of course, obviously, everything is an opinion. And as we know, everybody has their own opinion about uh, the Super Bowls and anything sports. But I really wanted to do it this way. Uh, I'm going to show, instead of uh, the the football cards of years past I'd like to go back and show some of the logos of the NFL teams. And they all share one thing in common. These are all teams that have somehow or, or finally did win Super Bowls. And of course, some have dominated like the Steelers and of course the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, just, uh, I, I know I've done previous shows on, on my favorite logos or my favorite uniforms in the NFL or the NHL. So it, it kind of further reinforces that. But um, they kind of give you, the logos, kind of a, a feeling of what I, I really thought was the most significant uh, Super Bowls so far in uh, the history of the NFL. And without further ado, I'm going to start with probably the worst. I shouldn't say... Yeah, actually, it is my top 10. Let's start with 10, and let's see if we can go all the way down. And, of course, I definitely think this is a tie <laughs> for 10th place, and that is the Washington Redskins defeating the Denver uh, Broncos 42-10, along with Denver being destroyed 55-10 by the San Francisco 49ers. Now, why I think they are significant is this. Um in many respects, obviously, the Washington Redskin win, that was the first uh, black quarterback to win an NFL Super Bowl game, and that was Doug Williams. And if you recall, Williams uh, was nearly hurt and taken out of that game and then just went on a just uh, a blitz of just points scored by the Redskins. Remember, they were trailing in that game, and it was not, <laughs> if anything, probably really the only thing that keeps that game in mind is the fact that Doug Williams, a really good guy, uh, won that Super Bowl for the Redskins. Remember, they have three different winners or three different quarterbacks uh, win the Super Bowl for them. And uh, along with Doug Williams, you had um, – you had Joe Theismann, and of course then, and I always get Mark, uh, why I, I have a brain lock with him, but I'm going to get, the, oh, Mark Ripien from Washington State. Uh, he was the third quarterback in that trifecta of wins by Joe Gibbs and the Washington Redskins. Do you realize when, when I think about it, and of course this is another uh, reason why I probably picked this, do you realize that during that 80s run, the Redskins 
eventually the Cowboys and the Giants would all win a number of Super Bowls, not just one, but a number of Super Bowls. The NFC East, with really the exception of the 49ers, really dominated the Super Bowl for the NFC for a while there. And uh, really, when I think about that Denver game, it wasn't even close. I remember being at a friend's house watching that, and it wasn't even fun to watch other than watching Doug Williams destroy the Denver defense. All right, with that, because I want to keep moving on this, you know, I've had a penchant for going off on tangents and not getting to some of my stories that I've highlighted or wanted to theme for this uh, program each week. But the other game that I, I do put in that, and that's the Denver-San Francisco blowout, 55-10. I just recall this about this game. I knew... You know how you just know that there are just some games you just feel real strong about, whether it's the teams participating or just a general sense. I just knew that one was, and I rarely do I ever talk about gambling or point spreads or anything, but I just remember that no matter what the point spread was on that game, it kept increasing because many fans like myself just knew that Montana and the 49ers were going to destroy the Broncos. And anybody who had been watching, and that year was, I'm just going to get the year, um, it would be Montana's third uh, and final uh, championship uh, with with San Francisco. Remember, he would go on and finish his career with Kansas City. And uh, that game wasn't even close as I look at it. That was January 28, 1990. I can't believe that's 30 some odd years ago already. But in that game, it was already it was 13-3 after the first quarter, 27-3 after the second. And then it was 41 to 10 going into the fourth quarter. And San Francisco just kept adding points, adding points. The only highlight was that the Broncos kind of got back into it with a David Treadwell 42-yard field goal to make it 7-3. And then it was whew, all Niners after that with just a, a attack on touchdown uh, to make the score 55 to 10. Uh, actually, it was 41 to 10. LA to David, uh, a three yard rush um, with David Treadwell adding the extra uh, point, but 55 to 10. Still one of the most dominating performances by actually the 49ers in any NFL team in Super Bowl history. And it was not a fun game to watch. I can even remember that again. I was at friend's house. We turned it off at halftime and turned and watched movies instead. Didn't even bother watching a halftime show. Didn't even stick around to watch the app. That's how bad that game was for the Broncos. And I, I always recall, I don't know what the ratings were on that game, but I have a feeling many fans did the same thing because it was almost like, you know, it's like watching a, an expected 15-round championship match and it lasting two rounds. And in those first two rounds that you see, the one guy just dominates the other. I mean, where the underdog doesn't even get a, a good punch in on the heavyweight, goes down, and now the uh, television station or the uh, company is left with, let's say, so much time to fill talking about that two-round fight. That was what the uh, that Denver-San Francisco game was, was about. Uh, San, Denver, you know, really, you got to give the franchise credit. They never um, really, they got embarrassed in a couple Super Bowls, really, when you think about it, between the Washington and the 49er game. They scored 20 points and gave up over 90. And yet, Elway uh, never quit, got back, and won not one but two Super Bowls to really help his extraordinary uh, Hall of Fame career um, and beating the Falcons and then, of course, beating uh, the Green Bay Packers. So those are my two worst, but they're still significant. Why? Because when I, I'm looking back now at the games – Really, um, the games that we're talking about with the Super Bowls, they haven't really, after that 90 game, I can't really consider any of the games. Well, I guess Dallas over Buffalo 52-17, and even the Charger game, at least when they lost to Steve Young and the, and the 49ers, at least the Chargers put some points on the board. Uh, they weren't in the game, 
But you know what I mean? At least there was something for Charger fans to cheer about in those games. But as I'm looking at this, outside the Ravens beating the Giants 34-7, there haven't really been as many... How, how should I say this without being unfair to the Niners? That was a Boro blowout game. Never was there any doubt that the Niners weren't going to win that game. And in my mind, and this is where I come into play. I think they were, uh, I know they were double digits. I don't know whether they went as high as 18, but I just knew they were just going to blow out the Denver Broncos. I've been wrong before. I'll probably be wrong in my pick today. But that one, <laughs> I wish I had uh, uh, an Ernie Bil Bilko type of way. If you ever watch uh, the uh, Phil Silver show, that guy just loved the gamble and all the rest of it. If I uh, had a gambling penchant, I wish I had put uh, quite a few stakes on that game because I would have won going away. It was unbelievable. All right. So I'd like to transition to the next game. I have this as number nine, and I know that. Giant fans, Bergen County fans, Jersey fans, and all the rest of it um, will probably obviously put it higher. I'm trying to be honest and fair about this. It is significant in a lot of ways in terms of our uh, political climate at the time, but the 1991 Super Bowl, and it was a good game. There's no question about it. Uh, when the Giants beat uh, the Buffalo Bills, the Buffalo Bills in uh, really – I always felt sorry for the Bills because I always say had Scott Norwood made that field goal, we wouldn't be talking about uh, – probably we're talking about Bill Parcells as a Hall of Famer in a different light. And who knows? Maybe none of his staff goes on to coach other teams, namely Bill Belichick. All right? But uh, that is the first – really, when you think about – and I will put this in here. It is significant in this way. The Giants do beat the Bills. Uh, Whitney Houston performed an unbelievable national anthem. You have the uh, you know, fighter jets going over. Uh, we are about to enter a war with Iraq, Operation Desert Storm. So there's a lot going on outside the football game. And then the Giants really gave us a great game in this respect. Never. You, you talk about a team sticking to a game plan. That was the Giants in that 91 game because they just – uh, took the clock away from a Bills team. And I think anybody who was being fair to uh, being a Giant fan or an NFL fan knew that if probably had the Bills just had that ball for about five more minutes, they probably would have beaten the Giants by 10 points. That wasn't to be. And of course, the game comes down to Scott uh, Norwood just narrowly missing a field goal. Always felt my heart goes out to Scott Norwood, just like anybody else, because it is and they are pros, but you know what? Uh, it, it's got to be. It was devastating to the uh, Buffalo Bills that year. They had a great two-minute offense, which they ran constantly through the game. They were just a very potent offense, a very good football team, much better than the 04 Minnesota Vikings. And as I've stated on previous shows, you got to give the Bills credit that not once, not twice, they returned to the Super Bowl four straight times. And anybody who says, well, the AFC was weak, okay. But look at how hard it is to get back to the Super Bowl. Just as a winning team. And then look at how hard it is to get back now as the team that got beat in the Super Bowl and come back, come back, come back four times. And it's really a remarkable achievement. I know they're the bridesmaid and not the bride. But to get there four times is significant. And, of course, that game uh, with Otis Anderson, and I love saying this, I got to meet Anderson. It's not, a, it's not I'm not dropping names or anything. I, I met him just uh, years, years, years ago, uh, just on a, on a lark. And great guy. I saw the ring. His hand swallowed mine. <laughs> I could have put two hands out there, and they both would have been – just a great athlete, just a great player, and a great guy uh, that I got to spend a couple minutes just talking to. Anyway, love that one, uh, that Super Bowl. Do remember watching it. Couldn't believe that the Giants actually won the game. The funny thing is, I was not – that was a, a great game, but people don't realize this. The Giants 
had defeated the Joe Montana, San Francisco 49ers in San Francisco. Uh, I think it might have been the previous Sunday. Regardless, they beat them for the NFC Championship with nothing but field goals. And that game, I really did feel the Giants were going to beat the Niners. Don't ask me why. I just had that gut feeling again. Didn't think the Giants were going to beat the Bills, though. So, you know, if you think I'm some sort of Swami or <laughs> fortune teller, I'm not. But um, I remember watching that game. And to me, I was more gripped with the Giant 49er championship game than I was with the Bills and the Giants. And, of course, I don't know. If you ask Giant fans which one they think is it was a more terrific game, they would probably say the Bills game. But they don't get there unless they play an unbelievable game. And if you remember, Montana does get hurt in that game. And remember that they had the Gary Reasons fake punt that really did help the Giants uh, win that game uh, against 15, 13, 15. Yeah, I think it was 15, 13. They beat the uh, uh, the San Francisco Foreigners. I'm not going to go looking for it right now simply because I get lost in the, uh, the computers. Then I just wanted to say this. I think... Uh, probably the Cowboys uh, defeating the Steelers is probably the best of any of the games that the Cowboys actually played. Now, growing up, I was a Cowboy fan. I loved Staubach. You might say that the Cowboys' first Super Bowl win against the uh, Miami Dolphins it was a boring game, though. It was a boring game. What makes that game significant is that, you know, the Cowboys don't get back the next year. But the Dolphins do. And then they get back again. And, of course, the Dolphins, and I put this in here, but uh, the Dolphins would would rebound and go undefeated the next year and then cap it off with a Super Bowl win over the Washington Redskins, 14-7. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But um, I would say the Cowboys, which one I think is significant? Uh, I don't know whether it's the 35-31 Loss. Well, wait a minute. I shouldn't say that. Cowboys played two terrific games against the Steelers. They lost the one 35-31. Actually, they played another terrific game. The 76 game, which they lost 21-17. People don't realize they were up in that game 10-9. Uh, there was a block punt, which kind of turned the tide against the Cowboys. But they actually had the ball in the last 30 seconds of that game. And Staubach does throw almost another Hail Mary because he had done the Hail Mary against the Vikings uh, two previous or three previous Sundays prior to that. Remember, they, they beat the uh, on the Drew Pearson bomb up in Bloomington against the, uh, the Vikings and win that game. Oh, actually, let's just do this. I really believe that the Cowboy win over the Steelers was probably the best game the Cowboys ever played. And the reason being is for what I just said. They lost twice previously, kind of heartbreakers. You know, the Jackie Smith drop pass uh, by Staubach. Who knows uh, what would have occurred in the game. But here are the Cowboys. Love that logo. But you would have to say that when the Cowboys really got their revenge and beat the Steelers in uh, Super Bowl, I just want to see what Super Bowl that is. That's like 1996. I'm going to say, right? Yep. Cowboys over the Steelers. Larry Brown is the, um, and I'm going to put the Steelers up there. Larry Brown is the MVP in that game for the Cowboys. Uh, he does sign a deal with Oakland and never, uh, his career was, was not as great as those two interception uh, balls that he intercepted against the Steelers in that game. 27-17. It's a 10 point difference. It was closer than that, but Got to be honest with you. I think the Cowboys, when when we talk about Cowboys, you could talk about the Blunder Bowl, and I would love to devote, and I'll probably do it next year. I was looking at that Blunder Bowl game, and this is just a, a quick aside about this. I watched that Blunder Bowl game, and if there was, and the interesting thing is, if there was ever an argument against under further review, it was actually that Super Bowl. Because the referees did an incredible job in that game in terms of their calls. 
They really did. Now, there was a fumble down at the goal line. I forgot about this. Probably that would have been reviewed today. And I got to be honest with you, upon further review, it probably would have been uh, the same uh, decision made by the referees on the field as up in the booth. And that was this. Cowboys were driving. Uh, and it was really, it was really aptly named the blunder ball because not only I think were there 11 turnovers in the game by both teams, the Colts and the Cowboys, but there are a number of penalties that, which really cost the teams from getting, let's say a, a grip on the game. Well, make a long story short, Cowboys are driving. I think they might've been up Maybe it was 3-3, three, three, or I'm going to say 6-3, but it was first half. They had a first and goal, courtesy of a great catch by Bob Hayes, and then a roughing the passer on Craig Morton on the same play. So they move the ball halfway, and now the Cowboys have it first and goal, let's say at the six of the Colts. In actuality, probably the penalty hurt them because it took away a number of their plays. Anyway, um, Morton... They ran the ball, got stuffed. Then on second down, and this is incredible. This is the game of inches and all the rest of it. George Hendrick, the stork, who would go on and have some great memorable moments with the Raiders. He was 6'8". I remember him being like an unbelievable tall outside linebacker from the University of Miami. Well, he comes storming in on a screenplay, or I I, I assume that it was called a screenplay by Kirk County, probably called, let's say, uh, a safety valve pass into the flat. And Morton saw Dwayne Thomas. And ahead of him was Blaine Nye, I believe, number 61. And he sees him. Morton, there's nobody there. He was just going to, he could have crawled in for the touchdown. And who knows what would have happened. Again, make a long story short, he throws the ball, but it's deflected by the tall six foot eight stork. And really when he reached his arms up, man, he must've been like eight foot tall. And so Morton never threw the ball high enough. And all he had to do was loft the ball over this. And I guess he just didn't take into account how large (laughs) Hendrick's arms were. He deflects the ball and uh, the Cowboys don't get the play. And then they ran another play and now it's fourth down. They had to bring in Mike Clark to kick a field goal. And he was, I'm telling you right now, I remember Mike Clark really being an adventure, but he kicked the field goal. They took like a 6-3 halftime lead. However, had they scored there, they would have really had a commanding lead and really put uh, Baltimore up, you know, uh, against a a rock and a hard place. Really would have been put up against the wall. And there was, um, and I, well, I'm trying to think if it was on the same play. I don't think it was, but... Later on, the Cowboys fumble at the end zone or on the end zone. And Cowboy probably players will tell you that they had a touchdown. Of course, the Colts will say, no, they fumbled in time and all the rest of it. So that was another uh, potential touchdown was thwarted either by just a fumble or just great play by the Baltimore Colts. And, of course, the Colts win that game 16-13 on a last-second field goal. That was set up by a Morton interception. Tommy Curtis uh, intercepted the ball and then uh, number 32 for the Colts ran it back. They got in field goal distance and that was it. All right. So I'm going to say this. Probably the Cowboys, the one um, 27-17 where they get vindication is is their best one. All right. Or is probably a most significant one. Okay. Now I got to be honest with you. Got to talk about the Steelers, and it's probably their first Super Bowl that they ever won. It was a drab, boring game. The first safeties ever registered. I think the Steelers lead 2-0 at halftime in that game against the uh, Minnesota Vikings. I was rooting for the Vikings because I was more of an NFC fan than I was an American Football Conference fan. Probably today, I would have been happy that the um, Steelers won Remember, this would be the second trip. No, actually, this is the third trip for the Vikings. Uh, in ready for this, one, two, three, four, five. Third trip for the Vikings in six stops. I think everyone thought that the Vikings would finally win this one. 
They don't. And uh, I just want to tell you this. 16-6 is the final. Uh, and in that game, yeah, the Steelers take, ready for this, a 2-0 lead at halftime, courtesy of a safety uh, with Sherman White, an unheralded member of the Steel Curtains, tackling Tarkington in the end zone. A 2 nothing game. It was played in a drizzly type of, of uh, rain into lane. It's not the first time, really, that the Vikings would have miserable conditions at Tulane Stadium because the first time they played uh, in the Super Bowl, they played, of course, the Kansas City Chiefs. And Kansas City won that game. Remember, they tried to land a balloon. It got blown off course. There were tornado warnings all through the out New Orleans for that game. The, the memorable things for me was that uh, Hank Stram is mic'd up on the winning side uh, with the Chiefs. And uh, he uses the word, like I said last week, matriculated. First time I ever heard that word. And I've used it sometimes in my vocabulary since. Uh, and he was talking about the Chiefs, a, a great play, uh, a catch and run by Otis Taylor, Hall of Famer in that game. But that game was marked by a lot of mud and really the Vikings not scoring in the first half as well, really being down, I think. Maybe, I, yeah, I think they were down 23 nothing, and then scored a late touchdown in that game. Why I think that's significant? Because the Steelers would go on and really dominate the 70s. They were, and I love this logo, and I know it's from the 60s, and I know that you were probably thinking of the, the logo that's on their helmets, which I do love. It's unique. But this one I love with, with the construction worker punting the ball on an I-beam. I think that's so great. And it's, it, it, it's so typical 1960s logos. And that's one of the reasons why I love it. I wish they would bring it back. You know, even just put them as patches on the jerseys. I'd probably buy the jerseys. Like the cowboy one I just showed you. I would, without a doubt, buy that cowboy. I love that logo. Wish they would put it on their helmets for once. Love that logo, and you've heard me talk about that in the past. But anyway, I would have to say that the Steelers-Minnesota game, 16-6. Now, I'm not saying it's the most exciting. I'm just saying it's significant, probably the 10 most significant games in my mind. And the only reason is, is that the Steelers then set themselves up for being the team of the 70s, the team of the decade, right? Because they come back, they would beat the Cowboys twice, and they would also beat the L.A. Rams in a pretty good game in 1980. Um, so they are number six on it. Number five also wasn't a great game. It was 20 to nothing at halftime. And I'm talking about the first matchup between uh, the San Francisco 49ers and the Cincinnati Bengals. And, of course, that was Super Bowl 23. Sometimes I have trouble with the Roman numerals. I wish they would just now stop with the Roman numerals, just go to a number. It's just easier. I understand why they're doing it from a marketing standpoint. They probably all love it that way. The game was 3-3 at halftime. Uh, Bengals actually had a lead, 13-6 after the third quarter. I don't know why I always thought it was 20 to nothing. Actually a closer game than I thought, but um, I really thought that the Steelers, uh, excuse me, the Bengals were really manhandled. Remember they have that uh, goal line stop on the Bengals. Can't remember if it was the first quarter or, or the first half or like the third quarter, but the momentum shifted then. Of course, it's Montana's first uh, game in the Super Bowl, and he would go on and win three Super Bowl MVPs and four Super Bowls overall. But I, I like that one because, and I'm going to show you the, the great, this one's a great one. Love that Niner logo. I wish they brought that back and stuck it on the sleeve. Or even, you know, up here on their chest. It would look kind of cool there standing out. It would be different. Anyway, why I think that game is significant. Again, even though the clo the game was close, 20 to 16, if you, you talk to any San Francisco fan, and if they're being honest, you never thought that San Francisco, even down 13-3, was going to lose the game. Ever. And uh, probably for Cincinnati fans, I don't know how they felt about the game. Did they feel that they had a chance at the end? I just felt that the 
the Niners, especially with the the goal line um, defense that they they pushed on Ken Anderson and the Bengals, I never felt that they were in the game. And I know the score is different than indicated. Why I, I think that's significant, of course, is that it launches the 49ers uh, as a great dynasty team of the 80s, without a doubt. And then, of course, it spills over into the 90s with Steve Young. They won five straight Super Bowls. for the, Well, I shouldn't say five straight, but they won in their first five appearances. They won all five. Pretty remarkable. And, of course, Montana, one of my favorite players of all time, is at the helm. And the funny thing is, I wasn't a huge Niner fan. I liked Montana, and I did root for them over the Cowboys in that championship game. That was really the Super Bowl because, of course, that was the catch uh, really helped launch. But I really think this, that had San Francisco lost the Super Bowl that year, I don't know what we might be talking. They might have rallied, come back again, but I think it would have really tainted beating that great cowboy, you know, dynasty, America's team in that championship game. So winning that game both really underscores what they did against the Cowboys and then uh, really is the segue into being the dynasty team of the 80s. Next one I'd like to talk about has to be the Patriots' first win. And, of course, the Patriots don't get there unless for the tuck, quote-unquote, rule, that was instituted. I know a lot of people think something different about that. Uh, I would, I'd, I'd spend a ton of time talking about that uh, one day. Wow, I can't believe that was 2002. I remember watching the New England game with Tom Brady rooting for him, snowstorm against Oakland. Do I think it was a fumble? <laughs> <laughs> Do I think it was a fumble? <laughs> Do the Raiders think it's an incomplete pass? <laughs> Does Tom Brady think it was a fumble? Probably. Would he admit to it? No. That being said, that play of the tuck and then beating the uh, St. Louis Rams 20 to 17 in Super Bowl. Two uh, in Super Bowl 36 starts the Patriots on their way to six Super Bowls and, of course, Brady to seven Super Bowl wins. And, of course, who's at the helm? But it's Bill Belichick. Uh, you got to give them credit. I, I, I was saying this the other day. You've got everyone always, you know, here's the thing with Brady, whether you like him or not. Okay. The reason he's the greatest of all time is that he won, and he won on the biggest stage, okay? And you can say, well, he lost three times. Yeah, but he won six times. And he lost twice to the uh, to the Giants, who, good football teams. I mean, the one year I was really upset that they lost to the Giants when they could have uh, finished unbeaten. I really wanted them to win uh, that year. But other than that, you know, you got to give them – he rallied them uh, – Probably the biggest comeback win, the first, what, overtime win uh, in Super Bowl history, and you knew that Brady was taking the ball against the Falcons, and they were not losing that game if they're storming back all the way. And all Atlanta had to do was just uh, soak the clock, you know, just just, just run out the clock. And I think they, unfortunately, and I try not, try not to, you know, criticize teams, but – they appeared afraid not to lose instead of trying to win. And had they gone through, really, just run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, or, you know, you can be conservative, I, I guess. You know, sometimes you can be too conservative, all right, or you, you can take too many risks. Uh, the one play I think about where Ryan is dumped, they probably should have just run the ball, Okay. And all it did was just fuel the, the Patriots. Anyway, I think, though, that the first game, and it was a good game. Uh, New England wins that, I do believe, on uh, – that was the uh, Venetary field goal, if I think right. Yes, 
field goal with no time left. It was a tie game. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something about that. I was in one of those football pools and ready for this. I had 7-7, seven, seven, I think. And I lost on that field goal, even though I was rooting for the Patriots. I wanted to go into overtime and at least get the 7-7, seven, seven, I guess. Technically, we were playing fourth quarter. I don't know whether it would count it or not. Um, but anyway, no, I'm sorry. I lost it for the Carolina game. We'll talk about that in a second. But Vinatieri hits a, with no time left, I'm using football uh, reference. Um, and in that game, here's the incredible thing. Brady goes. 16 for 27, 145. He only has a rating of 86. And throws one touchdown pass. But, but he secures himself forever as the great of, uh, the greatest of all time in terms of the Super Bowl and the NFL in this respect. He's got, he's got seven of them, six with one team. And he proved he could win without Belichick in New England with Tampa Bay. So it's a very significant game in terms of the history of the game. And that's how I'm trying to look at it. It does launch the Patriots as the dynasty team of the 21st century so far. I don't think there is a shadow of a doubt. Okay. And uh, that's number four on my list. Then number three has to be Miami, the 14-7 game. I was thinking, I didn't realize this until I read an article this morning. Let me get the uh, logo. Do love this logo. They did have it for years on their helmet. It's it's okay. You, you know what I mean? I would love to have seen the Dolphin be a little bit more cartoonish, especially with the football helmet on top. That I would love to see. I did love it on the helmet with the white uh, background. It looked really good. And for years, I have to be honest with you, when I was watching old move, uh, you know, the old NFL, every once in a while, you might catch the uh, Miami Dolphins on TV and their aqua and we had black and white. But I remember seeing them in color with the aqua and orange. And I thought it was so cool, but wasn't a Miami fan. Never really rooted for Miami, but I love their logo. Uh, I love their helmets. And uh, those are things that just jump out at you. But you have to give Miami credit. They go 14 and 0, finish the season 17 and 0 with the win over the Washington Redskins, a game that they had handily, and then they tried to go for three points to really seal the deal. And I, only today was I reading uh, from an author who I like, but had they made it 17 nothing, it would have kind of punctuated their 17 0 season. Nevertheless, uh, <laughs> Gary U. Premium has the field goal blocked. He tries inexplicably to run the ball and then throws the ball away. And Mike Bass, number 41, just remember that, uh, for the Redskins, a safety, big, tough, strong guy, runs it back for a touchdown to give the Skins some life. And, of course, uh, I was just reading and just getting his uh, Kilmer's last play from scrimmage for them in that Super Bowl. He's sacked. I mean, he's dumped. And, of course, the Dolphins go on to record the win, win the Super Bowl, and then uh, finish the season unbeaten 17-0. and Pretty remarkable. And it was another, got to be honest with you, the, the Dolphins, in their two wins, played very boring football. They did beat the Vikings. That game, I never thought that I was rooting for the Vikings, never thought they had a chance. And, of course, they played that in the rain as well. Uh, the Vikings and the Dolphins, they never had a chance in that game. Uh, they were too much of a buzzsaw, the Dolphins. What is significant about the Dolphins, though, they rebound, get back to the championship. I think they're probably the first team to do that, which is pretty remarkable in its own, right? Not only do they get back, but they win, and then they win the following year. So you have uh, in, in the, the losers don't get back. Even the Colts, when they lost, it took them – uh, a couple of seasons to get back into it, okay? Uh, when they lost to the Jets, and that's my segue. Here are the Jets, without a doubt. Uh, the only reason I didn't make it number one, because it probably is the most significant. People think that that was what uh, merged the AFL and the NFL. It wasn't. They had already planned on the merger. What the game actually did 
was give the uh, AFL some respect and some legitimacy going into the league. And I tell you, everyone thinks that was a boring game. Watch the entire game again. It's played great. It rained that day. It was in the mud, so it's great. Love Joe Namath. I was rooting for the Colts, <laughs> but now as I rewatch the game, I so wanted the Jets now to win. That was a real nail biter. If you're a Jet fan, that's a nail biter. And do you realize that every turnover that Baltimore had in that game could have been a game breaker for them had things gone the other way? There was about three or four plays. Obviously, I, I you know, with the Jets. They had, I think, three interceptions in that game off Earl Morrill. Of course, they bring, they replace Morrill. And then I'm just trying to see. I think the Jets, yeah, Baltimore had five turnovers in that game. And Fumbles lost one. And they had four interceptions in that game. And the big one, of course, is the Johnny Orr one, which was a flea flicker. And, of course, the ball was intercepted uh, by the Jets. And, you know, they always talk, had the Colts, uh, had the Colts uh, scored on that play, maybe the game is, is significantly different. Remember, the score is only 7 nothing at halftime. But if you watch that game, Joe Namath is calling all his own plays, basically at the line of scrimmage. You are watching probably the, qu the quintessential field general at work when they talk about field generals in the NFL. He wasn't getting the plays off the bench and he wasn't getting the plays through a tight end or an offensive lineman like Staubach would or other or really today's quarterbacks. Yeah. Now he was calling everything at the line. It was a masterpiece. Really his greatest game he ever played in the NFL. And he goes 17 to 28. And of course the big trivia, he doesn't even throw in the fourth quarter. The Jets just chewed up clock, chewed up clock, and then got the insurmountable 16, nothing lead, which would be different today because you're two, you're two scores away from tying it. But then with no extra, you know, two point conversion, even though the AFL had it, not in the Super Bowl, uh, he engineers probably the greatest upset in Super Bowl and maybe even in American sports history. And of course, how can I forget? The Chiefs and Green Bay playing in the very first one. And why? It was a blowout. Close at halftime, 14-10. Turns out into a blowout. But because of that one game, even though it wasn't a sellout, because of Super Bowl one and the whole aura of Vince Lombardi, who has the trophy named after him, Bart Starr with two MVPs, courtesy of the win against Kansas City and Oakland, we are today talking about not the NFL championship, Super Bowl Sunday. Hope you enjoyed. This is Willow Tool. Shout out again to Howard Fredericks and thanks to all who watch. See you next week with another edition.